Okay, great. Thank you very much. Welcome back. So now uh, Christy will continue to uh, moderate the next part of the presentations. The next part of our um, workshops okay, uh, would be about pedagogy. We got, um, we are very pleased to have three speakers, one from Hong Kong U, Anthea Chung will be talking about Reflection Journal, Hong Kong UST will be talking about task-based writing activity, and Simon Wang from Hong Kong BU, Baptist U, will talk about an online platform for annotating expert and learner uh, corpora. So, could we just invite okay, Anthea to speak first? Hello. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my screen. Uh, yeah, I try to exit my screen first. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthea. My topic is using a reflective journal to help students build presentation skills. Right, so let me start by telling you about the course I taught last semester. It was professional communication skills for year two students from the Faculty of Architecture. So uh, presentation skills was one of the components with a focus on making spontaneous speeches and handling of Q&A. Right, so at the beginning of the semester, I wonder how much my students already knew about making good spontaneous speeches. So I asked them to produce PowerPoints. So as you can see here from uh, these PowerPoints produced by students, they have a lot of good items under the do's and don'ts, right? So that tells me they do know a lot already, okay? But the problem is they cannot apply what they know. Um, so because we're talking about skills, okay? Yeah, that's um, quite common to find that. So uh, to make a difference, I decided that I need to support my students to be more reflective in their, in their improvement of, in their acquiring of the skills. So um, to be reflective would mean uh, continually making connections between knowledge, self-understanding and actions. Right, so let me tell you about the e-journal I used in the course. Um, so uh, I wanted it to be a journal uh, because I want the students to see as a practice uh, an ongoing process and not uh, one of exercise. Okay, and I also want to give them a personal space to write about their reflection. They don't have to share with their classmates, uh, but it should allow me to make comments. I'm going to explain this point in a bit. And it has to be an online platform. There was no other way to do a journal, right? So uh, for Hong Kong U, the learning management system we used was Moodle. And in it, I found the function journal that uh, was able to meet all the needs, which was great. And um, it was also a non-assessed activity. Uh, so the upside of it being non-assessed is that it's voluntary. Uh, students uh, will feel a little pressure to do it, um, thereby making the reflection more genuine. Okay, but of course the downside would be that some students may not do it at all. Okay, and because it's non-assessed, I had to find uh, simple models. Okay, so um, I looked at Cops, I look at gifts, and I decided on the Driscoll model of reflection because uh, there are only three steps. That uh, should be quite simple for my students to handle. Okay, so this chart shows you how I conducted the whole activity. So um, in the beginning of the semester, I uh, my students uh, practice speaking by making a series of short speeches. And then with that, I ask them to reflect on their strengths, weaknesses, and put down the action plan. So this reflection was not even based on any model. It was very intuitive, requiring no explanation. And the participation rate was quite good. I had 90% of them in one class doing it. I was quite happy about it. 
in the middle of the semester, there was one, uh, one, one presentation practice where the students had to uh, do a presentation in front of all their classmates. There was where I uh, gave them uh, individual feedback verbally first, and then I also put down uh, the written feedback on the journal, okay? And the reason I did that was that um, I was hoping that they, they could see the difference in their performances over time, okay? And there's another reason I would tell you in a minute. Um, so this is a, a sample of uh, my students' reflection. This is where they write the reflection and put my comments here. Okay, uh, so here is another reason why I integrated teacher feedback into the journal. So we know that in reflection, the learner is expected to perform self-evaluation, but it's been noted that even experts struggle to capture accurate self-assessment. Uh, so these two teachers, Amos and Brunette, they, um, in, in their um, teaching, they, they asked their students to consider peer assessment in writing reflections to moderate the uh, self-evaluation. And for me, I use teacher feedback as the reference so that um, the self-assessment could be more accurate over time. Okay, and coming back to my timeline, so, um, uh, near the end of the semester, there was one major assessment practice. With that, I asked my student to write another round of reflection using the Driscoll's model this time. And the participation rate was a lot lower. I reckon the reason was that it was end of the semester and uh, the, the students were probably busy with their own uh, assignments and it was not easy you know, for them to find time to do an out of class activity. And then this reflection writing is, has to be done out of class, not, not during class time, okay? And also uh, for those who put down the feedback, uh, put down the reflection, I gave them also some informal comments. Okay, uh, here is some sample from my students uh, for the second round of reflection activity. Okay, and I would say that for those who did the reflection, um, they did a good job, I would say. Yeah, okay. Right, so here comes my conclusion of my experience. Um, I find that students need to be motivated to participate in a non-assessed reflection activities. Right, and um, so one thing is that there should be some well-defined experiences to reflect on. And also, um, I find that students seem to have higher motivation when they perceive the reflection will lead to better future performance. In other words, it's better to do it in the early semester to, to get the results, uh, you know, to, to, to make them feel that, you know, they, they can use the reflection to uh, create better performance. Uh, but actually, these two requirements are conflicting. Okay, um, yeah, if, if you think about it, uh, you know, as teachers, I have to strike a balance between these two. Okay, and um, well, uh, lastly, just uh, some useful pointers from literature about uh, doing reflection with students. Um, it's useful to remind students to make connections between the theoretical understanding, that's what they were taught with, um, their personal experience. Uh, so when they can make the connection, that's when uh, deeper learning can happen. Okay, the other point is that the model chosen should act as a guide rather than an overly prescriptive set of rules to encourage authenticity of students' reflection. I think it's genuine reflection that will really help students to reap the most benefit from such activity. Okay, so with that, I end my presentation. Thank you, Anthea. Now we have Dr. Koilu to talk about um, task-based writing activity to enhance student engagement. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yilmaz Koilu. Let me share my screen very quickly. And I'm going to time myself. Okay. So, Today, I'm going to talk about task-based writing activities to enhance student engagement. 
Uh, here is the agenda. First, I'm going to briefly talk about task-based language teaching. Then I'll talk about writing instruction through the lens of task-based language teaching. Then I'll focus on purpose, context, and audience, and why they are significant in writing instruction. I will end with two task-based writing activities that I asked my students to do this semester in one of my classes. Very briefly, what is task-based language teaching? It's using tasks as, uh, as a means to teach language, right? Uh, but what is a task? In language pedagogy, task is the unit of analysis throughout the course design, uh, in implementation, and evaluation intended to meet the communicative needs of learners. A task is a language learning endeavor that requires students to comprehend, manipulate, and produce target forms while they perform some work plans. When we are using task-based language teaching, we need to ask ourselves, what are the needs of my students? What are the actual tasks that my students need to complete in real life using the target language? What are some pedagogic tasks that I can carry out, uh, that I can create based on genuine tasks through the completion of which my students can acquire the target language? So let's look at writing instruction through the lens of task-based language teaching. What is writing, first of all? Writing, uh, when defined broadly, includes visual, digital, and inscriptional modes of communication. It's essential to all academic and civic endeavors. Writing enables scholarly exchange of ideas. It facilitates civic and professional participation. It inspires creativity and innovation. It transforms students into leaders, activists, inventors, artists, teachers, and citizens of the world. So what should we do as, uh, in our role as English as a foreign or English as a second language teachers in teaching writing? We need to ensure that all students develop sophisticated communicative strategies through understanding their own writing processes, assessing the context and audiences for their ideas, and articulating their messages clearly, passionately, and persuasively. We need to make sure that we clearly communicate to the students what the topic is, some information about context, the reasons for writing, and the audience of the text. Let's um, <clears throat> look more critically at the importance of purpose, context, and audience in writing instruction. Sometimes we have some writing prompts that are extensively used in EFL ESL classes, and there is no reference to purpose, context, and audience. Here are some examples. Do you think that the death penalty should be abolished in the US? Is it better to live in a city or in the countryside? Why? Do you prefer to fly, to take a train, or drive when you travel? Why? Do you agree that computer games lead to violence? And it goes on and on. And when students are asked to write things based on these prompts, they don't know why they are writing, right? So we have to be careful about purpose, context, and audience in writing, but what is purpose? So students need to know what the purpose for writing is. What will be achieved through the act of writing? What is the function of writing except for language practice? They need to know about the context. What is the topic to write? Who are the students? Are the students assuming different personalities for the purpose of the writing? Uh, or do they have sufficient background information about the issues surrounding the topic? As for audience, who is the audience? Who are the students writing the text for, right? Based on these considerations, here are some genuine tasks. Writing an email to a professor, applying for graduate school, writing a statement of purpose, texting and chatting with an English-speaking friend through social media. Writing an email to Cathay Pacific for a refund for a canceled flight due to the coronavirus. Or similarly, writing an email to a hotel in Hong Kong to lengthen our stay from two to three weeks because the quarantine requirements have changed. I hope that doesn't happen to you. But these are genuine writing tasks, right? So let me show you two task-based writing activities that I uh, asked my students to do in one of my undergraduate classes. Here is the first one. <clears throat> uh, I taught an undergraduate class at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology this semester. It's called English for University Studies. And the theme was beauty and happiness. Regarding happiness, I asked my students to create a critical report or an opinion essay on whether the science of well-being course should be offered to all the students at HKUSD. So now you will ask, what is the science of well-being course? So here is the context and audience. You're a member of the HKUSD Students' Union. You have been invited to a meeting by the president, the provost, the deans at HKUSD to share your ideas regarding the course that can potentially be offered to all the students at HKUSD. The course will be similar to a happiness course at Yale titled The Science of Wellbeing. So this course is taken from Yale. So here is what the students did in the pre-task stage. They checked out the office of the president because they are invited by the president. They check out the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology Students Union website. They analyze the Yale course on Coursera. It's called the Science of Wellbeing. They specifically concentrate on the syllabus and the course materials. I asked them to watch a TED talk on one of the longest research on happiness by Harvard scientists. 
I asked them to read a New York Times article on the issue. This is regarding Yale's most popular class ever, happiness. And I asked them to read a scientific journal article on the issue. So in the task stage, they know what is expected of them. What is the purpose? Creating a critical report or an opinion essay on whether the science of well-being course should be offered to all the students at HKUSD. What is the context? They are told that they are a member of the HKUSD Students' Union. They have been invited to share their ideas regarding this course that can potentially be offered to all the students at HKUSD. And the audience is the president, the provost, the deans. So in the post-task stage, they get feedback. They put their um, critical opinion essay on Canvas. They get feedback from me, from other peers. They share their ideas on social media to gauge the sentiment of a larger audience. And finally, they share their ideas with other various stakeholders. So here is um, what one student wrote. I'll just read part of it. I don't think HKUSD should offer the science of well-being course for all students, because while mental wellness is of great importance to every member of our university, this course may just add unnecessary burden on students without producing the satisfactory result of improving their mental health. According to the comment section, one thing the lecturer emphasizes is that knowing is not enough and that practice is important. But the syllabus shows that from week one to week six, the course is just comprised of videos um, regarding materials and quizzes that takes two to three hours of time each week. Again, referring to the comment section, some pointing out that the course provides a lot of data that may be valuable from a research point of view, but from a practical point of view, those who genuinely want to improve their mental health by actually doing something in real life cannot really benefit from it. And it goes on like this. This is an excellent piece. You can look at it later. Another task-based activity, I'll keep it short. I asked students to create a happiness questionnaire to probe the happiness levels of undergraduate and postgraduate students at HKUSD. So what is the context and audience? HKUSD has five strategic objectives outlined in its 2021 to 2028 strategic plan. One of those objectives is to be an exemplar of best in class standards, practices, and operations. To that end, Office of the President at HKUSD um, aims to deliver the best possible campus environment for its students. You are a student volunteer working with the PR and media team. You have been asked by the director of the media team to informally interview students on the campus about how happy they are in a group of three to four students. Create a happiness questionnaire to probe the happiness levels of undergraduate and postgraduate students at HKUSD. The questionnaire should have 30 statements, four different categories, a happiness score for everyone that completes the questionnaire and suggestions to improve the level of happiness based on individual scores. I asked students to first skim the world happiness reports by paying particular attention to the criteria used and the ranking of Hong Kong. Um, here, here are the criteria. Uh, GDP per capita, social support, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, generosity, perception of corruption. I asked them to analyze the OECD Better Life Index by paying again particular attention to the criteria used because there is a different criteria, you can see it on the right. I asked them to check out the HKUSD strategic plan. I asked them to check out the media office. Um, I asked them to watch a YouTube video by the CNN on why Finland and Denmark are some of the happiest countries in the world. I asked them to read a South China Morning Post article on happiness in Hong Kong. And we see that the purpose and the context and audience, I'm not going to go over them again, but they are really clear. And they get feedback. They actually interview 20 students on their um, regarding their happiness level, and then they can publish their uh, results, right? They can write a short report on what they find, they can send it to the media office, or they can even try to publish that by sending it to South China Morning Post. Here is what my students created. They created questionnaires, they created different categories. Look at this one, category one, relationships. This is a Likert scale. I feel satisfied with my family and relationships. I am happy with my friends. Category two, living standards. I can afford basic necessities in my life. It goes on like this, society, I feel that there is enough social support, I'm satisfied with the efficiency of the government, and category four, they, they think that this is a big deal, psychological health, it has a lot of uh, items, but in total there are 30 items, so I feel able to solve the majority of my daily problems, and they also came up with a system how to calculate a happiness score, so if you say strongly agree to an item, you get one, agree 0 0.8, it goes on like that, so you can have a maximum score of 30. If you get 30 to 25 to 30, then keep up your healthy living habits. Uh, and then we have different recommendations for people who get different scores, right? So um, what do I want to say? Use task-based writing activities to engage students because we see that uh, when we use such activities, students 
produce excellent essays and excellence, excellent, excellent projects. Here are my references. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Koyu. Uh, I think the students have to read a lot and got really stimulated by a lot of different inputs. Now we move on to um, the last speaker of this session, Dr. Simon Wang who has a pre-recorded video to play and he will answer your question at the end of this session. Hi, uh, my name is Simon Wong. I'm, I'm working at the Language Center at Hong Kong Baptist University. I'm sorry that I cannot join the presentation live. Instead, I have to do this video, but hopefully I can join the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me doing this video presentation. Today, I'm going to talk about Lancet, which is the project that I'm working on. It's called an online essay and speech feedback system. We use this system to annotate the experts' presentations, scripts, and also their published text, as well as students' assignment. It's still a work in progress, but today I'm going to give you some quick demo explaining how, how it works. Basically, we've got uh, two types of people. We've got experts, and they've got our presentation online, so we can find a lot of them in, you know, in YouTube. And they also got published text, which, which we can use to teach students how to write. And then we've got students' oral presentation, and we've got uh, students' assignment. So whenever we've got oral presentation or audio text, we need to transcribe it using our tool. So basically, we just send the audio file to Google, and Google will transcribe for us, and we get the transcript back So using the API. And the service is not completely free, but it's quite affordable. So if it's oral presentation, we got a text, we got the transcript. If it's the text or assignment, we just get the text right away. And then we're going to go ahead and, and annotate using the comments that we build in the comment banks. So that's basically what we do here. The first thing I will talk about is why we want to transcribe our presentation. Now, uh, we're all language teachers and we watch a lot of students' presentations. I think one thing we have to recognize is that it's just not possible to take notes on everything that we hear when we watch students' presentation. We just take some notes and then at the end of the presentation, we just give a couple of comments that, that's about it. And compare that with the way we teach students writing, how we actually take a much closer look at a student's writing and, and give them much more comprehensive feedback on, on their writing. Now, once we have the script, it's all different because through examining the scripts, we will be able to see a lot of different things, like we can see whether the students are making any grammatical errors or they are using sophisticated grammatical structures in terms of the word choice, whether they are making the choices idiomatic, that they're using the right appropriate collocation, or they maybe there's some errors in word choice they have to work on, and also lack of coherence, or they have achieved coherence. So these are all the issues Usually, if we've got the, the written text, we can always address these issues when we teach writing, but that's not possible when we teach speaking now because we've got the uh, technology, we, we will be able to look at the students' uh, scripts. So uh, actually, I discussed this idea in the Chinese newspaper article um, two years ago, so if you're interested, you can check this out. Now, of course, there's some difficulties when it comes to implementing this teaching idea. So one thing we have to do is um, we have to convince the students, especially those hardworking students, they are not confident to give a presentation without preparing a script. So usually they just prepare the scripts. So we have to convince them to not do that. Instead, they have to learn how to speak spontaneously based on some outline rather than just uh, write down everything they plan to say in advance. And also we need to find the time, find the energy probably at the institutional level, we need to get more support resources so that we can start examining students' transcripts, looking at students speaking just like they're writing. And, and I think that's not easy. That's quite challenging because if we're used to the, the old way of, of teaching speaking, why do you want to change? I think that's always a problem. And, and also we have to convince the students to try to spend some time improve their oral presentation based on the feedback that we, we give them, then that's again a very difficult thing because the students have to be very uh, strongly motivated in order to do that. Now I'm going to just uh, do a quick demo. So one, one demo um, here is basically 
what we can do is just say we can ask students to prepare some outline for their uh, talk and then they can record the speech. So for now, I'm not going to do the uh, outline. So they just select the teacher and start recording. And so I'm not going to uh, put the outline here, but instead I will just say, so I'm going to go ahead and do a quick demonstration in terms of how the students can record their speech and then generate the transcript. So once we finish the, the recording, we can just go ahead and generate. But of course, this is just one sentence. And uh, once we've got this, we can do a quick preview and then we can submit it. And the teachers can play this back. So I'm going to go ahead and do it in terms of how the students can record their speech. And, and they can also the add comments. And they can also add a comment using comments from the, from the comment bank as well. And uh, here's a, a completed assignment that, as you can see here, th th there's actually some errors in the, in the transcript, but again, the teacher can play it back. So basically, when? and they can add comments again. All right, very quickly, I want to talk about the comment bank. I don't have time to do the demo, but I will give you a link. You can come back to look at the more details information. Imagine there's a comment bank and we can make comments to the student's text or expert's text. And whenever we make a comment, we can then add a comment to the comment bank, all right? And once there's a comment in the comment bank, we can use it again. We can reuse it. We can record it by using the sharp sign with some keywords. So you just type the sharp sign and uh, you will uh, find that comment and you can re reuse it. And another feature of this system is that we create an information page for each comment. So there's more information about the comment along with a list of examples. And we click on the example, we can go back to the context in which the comment was given. So that would be very useful for teachers to actually look at all the different examples related to this comment. And finally, I, I want to invite you to um, join me. If you find this project interesting, feel free to contact with me and, and maybe we can find more money to further develop this tool. So here's the, the link and my contact info. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Now is the Q&A time. We got a couple of questions that come up in the chat um, for Anthea. Okay, we got a question from Hebe Wong. Okay, so do you, uh, did, did you find any difference in the performance of students who reflect and who don't? Yeah, Hebe, thank you for the question. That's a interesting mm. question. Uh, I haven't looked it up yet because I have just finished marking all the assignments. Uh, but I suspect, uh, uh, you know, those who uh, perform the reflections are the more conscientious students. So they, they tend to do well anyway. But I, I do hope that the weaker students will benefit from the exercise, even though they don't do the second round, but they have an idea of what it is like to reflect and they would adopt it uh, in the future. Thank you. Um, there are two questions for Simon. Seems that people are more interested in the techie stuff. Okay. Um, the what kind of software is used in building uh, the feedback? Right. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry for not not doing a lot. Is uh, you know there's the video editing. So basically, we send all the audio files to Google. Um, Google has got a voice to text API um, application programming interface. So um, we, we don't really know all the details about transcribing, but um, we just send the uh, files over and uh, almost uh, instantaneously we will get the text back. Of course, the, the problem is we don't always have the kind of control over the quality of the, the transcription. So, but I think uh, the technology has become quite mature. So um, overall, I think I think it's quite uh, has 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 uh, quite a bit of potential, yeah, to be useful. So, so it is is the platform and just an in-house platform. Uh, for now, yes, because um, uh, our users needs to log on with HKBU email address, mm -hmm. and uh, we build this uh, with with uh, hiring a full time programmer um, with some funding from the university. Yes. Um, but we, we share all the codes uh, in GitHub. So if anyone who wants to uh, further develop, develop it, they can just go to GitHub and, and you reuse the codes. Yes. Oh, that, that would be interesting for GitHub. Um, uh, there's a question from Polyu J. 
what would be the accuracy level of the transcription for student users? Um, I don't really have any kind of uh, concrete quantitative information to answer that question yet, but the, the, my, my general impression is uh, over eight, uh, 90% um, for, you know, recently uh, good students. Um, and I also feel like um, some of the errors can actually be used for pedagogical purposes. You know, sometimes when students are not speaking in an idiomatic way, uh, that tends to generate errors because uh, the, the Google program is actually corpus based. So, so I, I do feel like some of the errors could be used for, for teaching as well. Thank you. Right. Um, any question from the floor to the speakers? I, I do have a question for, uh, for Dr. Koi Lu. Um, do you think the student, the, can the student handle reading so, I mean, uh, uh, standard material and uh, writing and uh, with the context of the precedent of? Yeah, they definitely can. Uh, I think we are sometimes underestimating the uh, potential of our students I think they really can. I, I know we are um, coming from like really great universities, all of us. Mm. But I'm sure that uh, my students can, your students can, everybody can, mm. as long as we, we provide uh, them with some authentic materials that will really engage them, not some outdated materials. So that's why in my classes, I, I try to make sure that I give them stuff that is relevant right now, today, rather than them working on something that was published like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, ago, that is not relevant now. So we have to take into consideration, for example, the effect of the coronavirus and this pandemic and everything else. Um, so yeah, I think they can handle that. All right, and one, one question for you. Do you have to change the task each semester? I try to, yeah, I try to adopt uh, uh, new things because like based on what is happening during that time, like th this semester, there were two things in my classroom. One was beauty and the other one was um, happiness. The second one was happiness. So I was always trying to incorporate like some actual genuine tasks that the students needed to carry out uh, in their real life, really. Uh, so yeah, this, this requires some work on the part of the uh, teacher, but I think uh, it's doable really because we have a lot of amazing resources. Thank you. Uh, Lillian, is it time for the next session? Yes, I, Lucas. Yes. Lucas okay. is actually yeah. the one helping to <laughs> yeah, keep the time. Yeah, okay, so on. I'll give the floor. Yeah, let's move on to LP. Okay. The last one is. So thanks for staying with us. Um, so the last section is about practices that refers to practices related to scholarship of teaching and learning. And first, we will have uh, Sarah Carmichael from the UST sharing with us about ethics in scholarship of teaching and learning. So over to you, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, we can't hear you. All right, let me start again. Um, I'll share my screen again. Um, okay. Okay, can you hear me now, LP? Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some ethical issues in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, now, all of us, I'm sure, are very familiar with research protocols and um, on research ethics in our different institutions. Everybody's got them, and they're all actually quite similar. Um, and they're usually based on very well-established principles in social science research. So let's just remind ourselves of these. Normally, they talk about how participants should be treated with respect. 
The principle of free and informed consent is quite important. So participants should know the purpose of the scholarship work and be free to refuse to take part. Privacy and confidentiality is always somewhere in there. Something about um, keeping participants' identities confidential, talking about the data, how the data will be kept and all those things. So this is pretty standard stuff. I mean, we're all familiar with it. Um, and basically these principles are all concerned with mitigating potential harm to human participants in research. But it always seems to me a little bit strange to be filling in these things because somehow they don't quite capture the kind of ethical issues that are involved when, when we're actually talking about human participants who are our own teachers and our own colleagues, and when we're working in our own institution, somehow it doesn't quite capture the complexity of that relationship. There seems to be something missing. And um, what seems to be missing to me is linked with, with this special role, this different role we have um, as scholars of teaching and learning, working with our human participants. So let's think a little bit more about some of those special factors. Well, one thing is, of course, unequal power relationships. So um, an unequal power relationships make some people vulnerable. Um, so obviously, we have unequal power relationships between students and teachers. So that puts students in a kind of situationally vulnerable position where they're at greater risk of perhaps agreeing to something because they want to safeguard their grades, they want to please their teacher. Um, so that's that's a danger. Uh, junior colleagues may very well feel some sort of pressure to take part in a senior colleague's research study, maybe feel pressure to be observed or videoed teaching, all sorts of things. So there's this kind of situational vulnerability because of the nature of our, our, our scholarship work. And of course, there's consent for, for minors, which is kind of an issue with a lot of us with year one students. So unequal power relationships is one thing. Another issue is this kind of dual role as both educators and scholars. So we're neither, well, we're both, we're both things at the same time. And this, this creates potential conflicts of interest. So research methodology isn't always a very good fit with, um, with effective teaching. So for example, if we're doing scholarship work, can we ever justify the use of a control group, which we may want to do for, for very good reasons? Um, might we be in danger of being accused of favoritism if one group only gets given something good? Um, and can we justify asking students or colleagues to spend more time on work for our scholarship inquiry, work that actually benefits us? So there's all these potential conflicts of interest. Um, and somehow this isn't really captured by those standard research ethics forms and protocols. So maybe when we start thinking about ethics and the scholarship of teaching and learning, we need to go beyond mitigating potential harm. So just trying not to hurt our participants isn't really enough. So maybe it's more productive to think about ethics in a more kind of positive and, and dynamic way, um, rather than focusing more on the mitigating of harm. So maybe, maybe one way to do it is to put our initial focus on what are we doing that's good? So what benefits might result from the scholarship activity? I mean, what benefits for the students, the colleagues, the institution or the unit, and for the wider community of educators and scholars? Because again, we're talking about this dual relation, this dual role we have as teachers and scholars. And we also need to think about what impact that this scholarship activity might have. I mean, we're asking people to spend time we're asking colleagues to spend time and we're asking students to spend time. So would the impact be just on our classes, on a course or the whole institution? Or might it have wider impact in the community, whether that's the teaching community or the research community? And does this impact justify the time that people are going to spend? OK, I'm no expert on this. I mean, this is all my results of uh, this is all me um, just reading and um, 
I found there's actually a lot of really useful stuff out there. A lot of people are thinking about this, both in our field and in, in other academic fields. And um, something I found that I thought was really useful was this matrix, which I've just adapted from Healy et al. Um, the references are on the final slide. And I just thought this was a really nice um, matrix for us to ask ourselves what we're doing and to try and ensure that our scholarship work is ethical. And what I like about this is that we've got the stakeholders and it looks at the different levels of scholarship work. So, OK, here, you know, substitute your own institution. So it looks at the kind of scholarship work that we might do at quite a sort of um, minor level, well, I say minor, a small, small scale scholarship when we're just looking at our own institution. Um, and then it also looks at how we might impact teachers in other institutions. So it looks at the scholarship inquiry from the perspective of teachers. Then it looks at the scholarship inquiry from the perspective of scholarship, of, edu of, of uh, researchers. So I think that's quite nice. And then these two, um, the two, um, the second and third column actually focus on leading us to think about what, what are we doing that's good? So what are the potential benefits and what are the potential impacts? And it also focuses on this need to balance because there's always going to be a risk and there's always going to be an impact in terms of time spent that people will never get back. So it kind of leads us into questions about, you know, what are the potential benefits and the risks? What risks are there? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? So it's quite nice in leading you to think about, um, you know, analyzing what you're doing and, and what benefits and what impact it might have. And then the last grid actually focuses on all these things that we see in the research ethics protocols and forms, which is to do with respect, privacy, confidentiality and consent. So this is the mitigating harm. And I just thought this was quite nice as a kind of guideline for subtle practitioners um when they're asking themselves about the sort of the ethical issues concerned with their inquiry so um basically from my reading um this is just a summary of some of the things that we need to think about when we're making ethical choices in scholarship inquiries so maybe the first thing is do good <laughs> the risk benefit analysis so what are the potential benefits and risks then there's the impact what are the potential impacts? So this is all part of do good. Then there's the do no harm, which is all the things we see in the protocols and forms from our institutions. But then there's this kind of analyze each situation with care because we're in quite complex situations where, you know, we have to, you know, make, make judgments based on our own kind of analysis and intelligence and knowledge of the situation. Ethics in education can't be prescriptive and we need to analyze each situation differently to make ethically appropriate choices. And then finally, be aware of the rules. Make sure you know what the procedures are in your institution and also what local legislation says. So basically, this is just a summary of some of the reading of I've been doing. And um, here's a few references of things that I found particularly useful. I mean, I found this Healy article very useful, but there's loads of stuff around. Um, so yeah, basically that's all I've got to say. I think I've kept within my eight minutes. Thank you. Sarah, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Let me stop sharing. Um, and we have Jason and Doreen, also my UST colleagues, uh, sharing with us their reflection on use of academic books. Hi everyone, can you see the share screen um, of the PowerPoint? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, then let me, um, let me try again. Uh, yeah, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much for um, attending our session. So, let's get started. Okay, our topic is yes, no, or maybe. It's actually a reflection of, um, of our experience of uh, introducing uh, academic, academic blogs to support launch fund transfer uh, with our colleagues at the Language Center at Hong Kong uh, UST. So uh, we will talk about the uh, potential and challenges in our, well, less than one year launch of, um, uh, of our uh, 
platform. So Doreen will give you a quick overview of what we did with the platform. So up to you, Doreen. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Doreen. I am the leader of the development team of this digital platform for scholarship. So uh, before we share with you uh, our reflection on how using academic blocks works in knowledge transfer in our trial, um, I'd like to share with you briefly the purposes and the design of this platform. The purposes of developing this platform is to engage um, the CLE members to showcase our scholarly work, to share our views on and experience in language teaching and learning, and collaborate with colleagues in the field of language education within and beyond CLE in order to support the development of scholarship of language teaching and learning in CLE. So, um, next slide, please. <laughs> The design of this platform is based on the framework for educational blogging by Dan and Yuan in 2011. Um, in this framework, I positioned our platform in the cognitive dimension um, down there. So uh, the design of the platform is intended to provide spaces and features that encourage and support activities for self-reflection and reflective dialogue. So far, there are three main features developed to support these potential interactive activities. There are namely publications, scholarship corner and events. Publication is uh, a space for our colleague to um, uh, post their reviewed publications and works in progress. Scholarship corner is in a form of academic blocks and event is for our colleagues to promote and, invent, and invite colleagues to participate in scholarly events. So um, the following is um, how our platform look. So you can see that um, the three major features are there. Uh, perhaps let's us show you a bit more um, what's in the scholarship corner, which is the focus of the sharing today. Um, so in it, um, you can see that um, this is where our colleague uh, block and to make and receive comments. So, um, this platform was piloted in August last year and was officially launched to the whole center in January this year. In these 10 months of time in our observation and periodical surveys, uh, we see colleagues faced the following challenges when using the platform. Next slide, please. Uh, Jason, next yeah. slide, please. Okay. Thank you. So um, the challenges um, faced by our colleagues are, say, for example, uh, what to post, how to post, uh, who will see their post, which is more uh, related to their concerns in privacy, uh, who will see the comments, who can manage the comments, um, which is more related to like security issues. Uh, what is the moderation process like who are going to review um, their posts and uh, their unfamiliarity with academic blogging, for example, format, layout, style, and even content. Um, so now Jason is going to share more about how we see and analyze these challenges from the theoretical perspective of sy systemic functional linguistics. So um, Jason, please. Thank you, Doreen. So to analyze the challenges uh, over the concerns of um, the academic blogs, uh, we find the concepts of genre and register of, uh, of uh, how they systemic functional linguistics pretty useful. First of all, as members of the development team, we see our roles. Um, uh, well, we have an important role um, to play to help colleagues to understand the social purpose of academic blogs. That is um, to showcase, to share, and to collaborate with each other. And also um, the concerns over field mode, uh, field tenor and mode, that is what to post, um, who can see and comment on the post, and also how to post should also be addressed. Um, um, the reality is we see there's a bit of a well, learning curve for both the development team as mentors to uh, support our colleagues and also uh, is it can be a, a bit challenging for our colleagues as content consumer and producers as well and that's why we put yes no, or maybe 
uh, uh, in the title of our presentation to show different levels of participation uh, 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 during our well, first year of launch of the DPS. Um, well, meanwhile, despite the challenges, we still see, we still identify some goodies from our DPS uh, experience. Um, we see there's a great potential um, in the DPS or academic blocks uh, as a common space and endeavor um, for uh, asynchronous sharing and also for overcoming spatial segregation. I'm sure this is very important in this time of the COVID and we believe it will be continue to be very useful after COVID. Um, also, we also see the potential for colleagues to um, learn and engage with each other through trial and error and to benefit from uh, peer feedback. Um, we believe uh, academic blocks as an affinity space, uh, to borrow the concept from James Poggi, um, well, it allows us uh, our colleagues to participate at, uh, at, our own, at their own pace, from peripheral viewing and following to leading and mentoring, uh, maybe at the later stage. So Doreen will conclude with some um, takeaways Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you, Jason. So from our experience in this first attempt in using academic blocks to facilitate scholarly exchange, we learned that we need to provide further support than uh, besides building the tool for our colleagues in order to help uh, each other to adapt to this new culture of sharing in our center. For example, uh, we found that we need to give a very, very clear definition for each feature in order to help them to distinguish um, um, the publications and academic blocks so that they know uh, what to post and, and where to post them on this platform, uh, to establish clear guidelines for posting, to design an appropriate and efficient moderation process for the publications, and to provide trainings um, such as workshops to help colleagues to use the platform technically. So um, here are all uh, we'd like to share with you today and at last we'd like to take this opportunity opportunity to uh, thank um, Melinda, our colleague Melinda, for her support in this project. And also, uh, I see our former colleague, Sean, is <laughs> also here. So we'd like to send you a big thank as well for uh, their inspiration and support. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doreen and Jason. Now with Dr. Natalie Fong and Dr. Loki Law from Hong Kong U, uh, the topic is about a learning transfer, teacher's perception and understanding of learning transfer. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Welcome to this sharing section. I'm Natalie. Uh, uh, I'm from the Center for Applied English Studies from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, I will be presenting with my colleague, uh, Dr. Loki Law today. Uh, the project of learning transferability from the CAES aims to investigate students' perceptions on the transferable skills in uh, CAES 1000 and English in the discipline courses, our EAP and ESP courses. This project is to support academic and professional literacy materials development and pedagogy, which is closely aligned with the teaching and language enhancement goals of Hong Kong U. Uh, Loki, next slide, please. All right, uh, after an investigation of students' perceptions on the learned skills uh, they find transferable in our EAP ESP courses and the extent of the transferability, we think it's worth exploring teachers' beliefs and perceptions of effective learning transfer in class. So that's, uh, that's why we conducted an e-survey with all uh, CES teachers last December. And today, Loki and I are going to share the findings with all of you. And we'll also share the subsequent changes to the course curric curriculum after the study, as well as the challenges we have encountered. Since the start of the project in October 2018, uh, 17 EAP ESP courses across five faculties, including architecture, arts, education, social sciences, and engineering, have been involved in the project and nearly 3,000 students completed the e-survey. And for the e-survey with the CAES teachers, we have obtained responses from eight program coordinators and 15 uh, uh, course teachers. 
let's have a look at the aims of the eSurvey. Uh, it aims to understand teachers' perceptions of learning transfer and to explore teachers' perspectives of how to promote learning transfer in classrooms and make transfer happen more effectively. Let me take you through to the uh, uh, qualitative findings that we obtained from the eSurvey. When asked, how do teachers encourage the teaching team to introduce the concept of learning transfer to their students? I selected some quotes of teachers' comments in the eSurvey. From these posts, we have learned that we should enable our teachers to understand the notion of learning transfer and know more about what can be transferable from students' studies. And uh, let's have a look at the last one. Explain to my teaching team why students need to take our course. I think it's very important uh, for the, especially for the program coordinators to explain to our teachers why our students have to take our course, the um, relevance of our course to the study in order to help them learn how to transfer the skills to other learning contexts. Let's have a look at more qualitative comments from teachers in the e-survey. Teachers are also encouraged to explain to the class what can be used and applied to future courses and to workplace related tasks. So um, you see two direct quotes here. Uh, have a look at the, um, the first one. Uh, this program coordinator suggested Sometimes they'll use reflection activities and student sharing. And another program coordinator shared, uh, they would tell the teachers to explain or reiterate the notion that they, what students learn in the course and how they could apply to future courses or to workplace related tasks. Another question, when teachers were asked, how did they support their students to help them be more aware of learning transfer? Let's have a look at their sharing. Um, they would uh, uh, help students to see the connections between the learning across the wider university curriculum. They will ask students to explicitly talk about that, what they have learned, what they will transfer or have transfer. And uh, some of the teachers also suggested they will ask the students point out the similarities and differences, uh, how certain skills could be applied in other learning contexts. And I think the suggestion here is to draw relevance to the applicability of course, course learning outcomes to other learning contexts and also discuss how this could be used in other class as well. So now I would like to uh, pass it to Lockie. He will be sharing with us the good practice of learning transfer. Lockie, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the good practice of learning transfer. Okay. Uh, so from the e-survey that we've collected, we have um, asked several questions and uh, now as you can see from this slide we have ranked these questions uh, according to this uh, number of strongly agreed and then by um, agreed uh, so if you look at uh, number nine question number nine well, uh, some of the most of teachers have chosen that um, that teachers should verbally emphasize the relevance of learned academic literacy skills to students subject courses uh, during the teaching uh, number 10, teachers should play a key role to help students develop their awareness of learning transfer in order to make transfer happen more effectively. Uh, number, nine, uh, sorry, number eight, uh, asking students to reflect their transfer experience of academic English skills. And then number seven, um, that uh, the teachers ex say that they're explicit in their teaching um, in terms of uh, in-class discussions with students. So to build up that connections between academic literacy skills uh, that students have learned in the class and then uh, their discipline specific skills they need in their faculty courses. And finally, we have number six. So, um, teachers say that they are uh, proficient at the transfer within the student's expertise. Okay. Um, so we have other uh, good practices of promoting learning transfer also coming from the teachers. For, for example, the first one is constantly reminding students that the skills that they acquired in class are not just for uh, the English learning, but also is to help them succeed in other English mediated academic classes. Uh, second point, uh, they all, it's very important to use uh, authentic material, obviously from the, um, the courses that they're taking, but also very importantly, the workplaces uh, that is um, related to their uh, majors. Finally, uh, we have some warm up activities or reflections for students, uh, particularly like, for example, here, uh, think of a situation or job where having good speaking skills might be useful to them. Okay. Uh, continuing, so we have uh, also 
got a teacher saying that, well, maybe using uh, peer feedback and also teacher students consultation to raise students awareness, asking students to identify types of assignments that they uh, expected to do in their faculty courses and highlight connections between those tasks that uh, they need to do. Uh, and here we have a quote from our teacher as well. Very, very uh, interesting one and um, very, very uh, in-depth as well. So exchange of writing experience in discussions between students of varying study disciplines and have students come up with commonalities of shared practices in academic writing. So that basically summarizes uh, all the previous points. And then uh, from the suggestions from the uh, program coordinators, uh, they have suggested that the students um, it, it, that um, can use the, sorry, uh, something wrong with my screen here, sorry. Okay, oops, so sorry. Okay, bring it back, back up, okay. Are you, uh, can you see? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Oh, great, oh, sorry. Okay. So uh, understanding students' disciplines, um, knowing that their uh, EAP and ESP skills that students need to apply to their discipline specific subjects, raising teachers' teams' awareness, which is uh, one of the most important, but also the most difficult for uh, the program coordinators, introducing the course ethos more clearly, and then uh, organizing more reflective activities, sharing for math students, finally offer more examples of learning transfer to students. So I'll pass the time back to Natalie to talk about the challenges of learning transfer. All right. Uh, thank you, Lockie. Uh, let's have a look at some uh, challenges of promoting learning transfer to classes. From the e-survey, uh, the program coordinators and the course teachers shared with us their insights. Uh, they thought that there actually is time gap and contextual difference between learning and applying. So what are the immediate effects of our courses? So it's very important for us to let our students know the relevance of our course to the future study. And uh, of course, it takes time to have perception change and, uh, and how to encourage content teachers to acknowledge the importance of specific uh, academic uh, literacy skills. All right. So that's why close collaboration with subject knowledge teachers is very important. Next slide. Yeah. More challenges, uh, teachers' awareness of the context of learning and the context of application. So it's very important for the program coordinators to uh, actually in the preterm course meeting to uh, train the teachers or to raise their awareness all right, of this concept, how to make this connection more explicit. right? And uh, actually, there, there is not enough practice-based example to show in class, especially some authentic example. So that's why more support, more training to uh, teachers, especially new teachers, uh, in order to help them realize what they are teaching and what students are learning. Okay, that's the end of our sharing. Hope you find the uh, uh, presentation interesting. I think it's very important for us to raise the awareness of the notion of learning transfer, not only to teachers, but also to students. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have a few minutes for questions. We already have a few in the chat box. First, we have uh, this response to Sarah's uh, presentation on ethics of uh, scholarship of teaching and learning from Miranda. And then we actually have quite a few questions about uh, the scholarship and the scholarship platform at UST. Uh, Perhaps uh, Doreen and Jason, you can give a response to that. Or actually, uh, Linda is here. So maybe you can answer these questions. Sure. Let's see. Um, yeah, scholarship at UST. So people are given time to do scholarship. And if they are given time to do scholarship, then they're expected to do it. And if they're not interested in doing scholarship, then we can have a discussion about that and then they won't be given time. So is it required? Well, kind of, it's required if you're given time. And if you're given time, it's required. That makes sense? I don't know who asked that. Doreen, would you like to uh, answer the questions first? 
Hello. Hi. Uh, I think Melinda um, actually answered the, the first two questions. Um, so the next question is whether the is that is the contributions to the platform counted towards staff annual appraisal and how the colleagues okay feel about sharing there. Um, I it. It is part of, and I wouldn't say this is really like for appraisal purpose, but this is uh, uh, part of an ongoing process of professional development. So definitely, it's it's colleagues' choices, and um, how do colleagues feel about sharing? According to our observations, we uh, see that they all see it very positively, first of all. Uh, and secondly, uh, we see that some are actually ready and got a lot in hand. Uh, so that they just go ahead and post. Um, and and um, actually, if you don't mind, you might it's our star there <laughs> who, who posts a, a lot, you know. So, so we can see that like, some colleagues are actually ready to share and they need this tool and and some are trying uh, and testing the water that we see uh, they uh, we can see that they are also uh, learning the culture and throughout the moderation process in the communication between us, the development team, and also um, the authors, there it's already uh, nego negotiations going on and, and dialogue. So it's another um, um, kind of unexpected uh, goodie that we, we got from this, uh, uh, from the moderation process in this project. And uh, so for those that who are trying bit by bit and start to communicate with us to learn uh, the culture uh, or, uh, in this new way of sharing. And um, we see that they are sort of like warming up. Uh, yeah, so, so um, they're sort of like um, warming up themselves in using this um, new way of sharing. Yeah, so yeah. I guess um, so that, my answer that this question. Related yeah. to our, uh, to, the, to Adam's question on moderate, who are the moderators? Uh, we, uh, the members of the developer teams, are the, the moderators. The moderators, in the sense of being a more like a gatekeeper, in uh, to make sure the format, the style, the contents are appropriate to post in the blog, uh, to encourage sharing and dialogue with with the uh, with uh, with the colleagues, rather than you know, like censorship. <laughs> so we are just moderating to make sure you know everything is correct, with, and then we press the publish uh, button. Uh, then it will go public. Uh, I mean, by going public, meaning internal, <laughs> um, um, and well, making internal for our colleagues to to look at it. Yeah. So I believe we have uh, answered the question, right? So more questions for three groups of presenters. Okay, if not, uh. I can hand over back to Lillian for the. Okay. I have one more question for Jason. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jason, like, is I, I'm not I, like the format of an academic blog. Is it decided already, or is it still fluid? Like, mm. Mm. I, I'm wondering, like, if, if someone did something very different to what you're expecting, should you say no? That's not acceptable, or maybe think well. That's possible. Well, um, well, it's a very good question, and uh, well, maybe Sean is a better person to answer the question. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I, well, actually, well, to me, well, when I look at blogs, students' blog, academic blogs, blogs mm -hmm. written by faculty members, actually comes in many different forms. Mm -hmm. um, mostly, well, people share their, I mean, academics share their ideas, their initial ideas about you know how to look at. Uh, Current issue or how to apply, you know, certain academic concept in analyzing something. So it can be many things. It can sometimes it can be a video. It can be anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I well at the moment I don't see there's a standard like formula or discursive you know, features for a particular blog. But for our DPS platform, we want to make sure that you know uh, what our colleagues post can generate response and generate discussion yeah. with the colleagues. So it shouldn't be just one way. So well, in that sense, where we moderate the, the <laughs> our colleagues' post to make sure, well, they have some of, they, they are sharing their opinion that can generate response. Yeah, it's, uh, so we have a, we have a, we have a, some requirements right, um, for the blog post. Am I correct, Doreen? 
<laughs> yeah, and and um, this platform so far is for internal use only. So so the DPS that we showed you is for internal use only. So um, I think our colleagues feel pretty free. Um, yeah. I, well, I I, I know there is an idea to make it not just internal, but um, mm -hmm. inter institutional or similar idea. How do you, would you think that could work? Would like UST colleagues be willing to share with PolyU, Hong Kong U, City U colleagues? Well, that's taking the conversation to the next level. I may not be the mm -hmm. right person to answer the question. Melinda, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just typing the answer. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we've just received funding recently to develop something that would be Hong Kong wide. And um, so what we're hoping is that we can keep this platform internal because that allows a lot more informal sharing within our center and then develop a separate platform that would be open for all centers to, to contribute to. Yeah. So hopefully more news on that in due course. Okay. I think that also answers right. one key question. So the main difference is one is internal, one is more cross institution. Mm -hmm. So actually, if you're interested in getting involved in that, let your center head know because we, the center heads know about this because they were involved in this bid. So if you want to actively contribute to the development side of the idea, do, do, do let us let your center head know. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, all the 16 presenters and all the colleagues who uh, have been here to learn and discuss and to share ideas really, really excellent. I think uh, um, I believe that uh, many of us will um, get in touch with some of the presenters and explore further ideas. In fact, uh, because of the time, I mean, taking the balance of the time, so we set it for two and a half hours here. Uh, I actually have got a Padlet, which I won't um, send you, but I'll put in the email, which is for you to share new ideas in small groups and also to put in comments and uh, I'll put just the link here, but uh, I'll, I'll send it out later. Uh, I mean, Lucas has the link, but I want to mention something um, on the Hub website. In fact, we have a session for project. So you see that uh, here, all the project, but many of the presentations just now that we have seen because they are really recent project. Uh, we don't have the information here. So I really encourage you to uh, send us the information and we'll update this here. So you can see the, um, you know, the project um, submitted uh, by different centers uh, posted under project here. So they are also being categorized into these main uh, sessions here. Okay. So yeah, so you can see the, um, yeah, so you can see the details, for example, if you go to say this one, right, so you can see the um, the names and the members and the summary of the project, some also got the, the links to their project, so a lot of information here, so get in touch with colleagues, and um, even though the time here is short, I think uh, it really has given us a good opportunity to learn from each other, really know what has been um, going on in different centers, and know about different uh, recent projects, so um, any you could stay behind, please, uh, to continue to talk. Uh, but I, I'm also aware of the time. So I know that uh, colleagues have commitment you would like to go to. So uh, yes, uh, uh, we, we promote for next next week. Next yes, Tuesday. true. <laughs> Thanks, Christine, for reminding me. Uh, yes, next Tuesday. And in fact, this Friday, um, and next Friday, we have three more uh, events. So this Friday, we have the one on face-to-face, um, um, -face remote and on-demand teaching related to developing and de delivering writing courses for the disciplines. So we'll get into really more much detailed about uh, teaching in the disciplines and uh, in relation to different uh, environment. And next Tuesday, uh, we have our sharing session on um, post-COVID classroom. So that is really something related to every one of us. So looking forward to next semester, we have heard about what will happen at Hong Kong U, I believe uh, the other universities, you also have heard about next 
next year's uh, arrangement, at least for the first semester. So we will come together to share and there we will also have um, 10 to 12 presentations. All right, from colleagues uh, from different centers. And next Friday, we have another session on uh, teaching in the discipline, focusing on presentation courses. So thank you so much, colleagues. And uh, please feel free to stay behind, really, to continue your conversation, to discuss with each other. So great to see everybody here.